Welcome to Just Relationships, the show that offers you concrete ways to make your relationships better. Whether it's your boss, your spouse, your children, or your friends, the quality of your relationships in life directly affects how you feel about yourself and the success you achieve. Your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer, a psychotherapist, telecoach, author, and seminar leader, will interview top experts to help you learn to manage this essential part of your life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer. Greetings to you. We can live with them, we can't live with them. Men, women, intimates, whether they are the same gender or not. And what happens when someone you are dearly in love with uh, and feel like they are an idol for you even to that point, and then they become the most hated person on the planet, so much so that you might even want to harm them. Very, very strange phenomenon in intimate relations, which is not just heterosexual, it can be homosexual as well. But the phenomenon of intimacy and where we lose empathy, where we don't have compassion, where we become apathetic, aggressive, controlling, all of that. Mm. If this is at all interesting to you, (laughs) Please stay tuned because I am so happy to introduce you to my guest, Stephen Andrews, who is a social worker specializing in compassion and gender relations and the men's movement and motivational interviewing and just about anything in the human um, love field. You remind me of Leo Biscaglia. Stephen, it's, it's, I mean, most people, you know, he's, it's been so many decades now, but uh, called the love guru, the love doctor, and your, your passion is compassion. Mm-hmm. And I should also let people know that I was uh, lucky enough to meet you when you were the founder of a camp for grownups, a summer camp for grownups, mm-hmm. originally called Recovery Camp, Recovery mm-hmm. Camp, which became Kindred Spirits. And I have been an active member for 25 years, mm-hmm. and it has changed my life. Mm-hmm. And you are responsible, Stephen Andrews, for many, many, many throngs of people uh, Mm. having better, happier lives. Mm. And that's only in my circle. I can imagine in all the other circles you've been in all these years. Mm. So you now have a a podcast uh, called Conversations in Compassion. Mm -hmm. So we can start with that, or you can just tell us where where all of this started for Mm. you. Well, that's a beautiful question. I, you know, the starting point is, uh, for me, it was a, a throwaway child. Mm. Uh, the starting point for me was uh, uh, the trauma of growing up in both abusive and alcoholic and violent family. Uh, and, you know, and ending up being on the streets and learning how to survive by stealing from people and um, being mean and trying to figure out how to live my life uh, often in a, you know, not so nice ways to people and to others. Along the way, I met uh, a, a couple of people who were kind and uh, they, they seemed like they wanted to do something to me or hurt me in some way. And it was uncomfortable, but they stayed with me. They became that compassionate witness in my life. Uh, They built what I call social capital with me. They were people I could turn to when I was uh, in a bucket of tears or uh, violent or enraged. And I I started to uh, want to do the same thing, uh, which is to be a compassionate witness to another. Um, And that led me to being a, a student of love and attachment and compassion and empathy. Um, And so today uh, at 70 years old, uh, I feel blessed that I have incredible 
people in my life who are now my compassionate witnesses and hopefully I am of theirs. Uh, wow. you, as you talked about recovery camp, you've, I've developed uh, all kinds of uh, groups of people all over the country, all over the world, but also right here in Portland, Maine, where I am, uh, I run 11 support groups a week uh, where over uh, 150 people come and they learn one particular skill. And that one skill is empathy. And it I is, know, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of us grow up in families where there's not empathy. And we have to learn the skill of empathy to survive in intimacy. I, lo- I loved in your introduction when you talked about, you know, intimacy. Yes. There, 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 there's a, a particular problem that we don't talk about. And that is that we are attracted spiritually to people in our lives who actually are there to bring up our trauma, our oppression, so that we can actually resolve it. And that is a sort of a a shadow of all relationships. They bring us together to work out that historical residue. And people love they they love the attraction and then it turns into the work the spiritual work to resolve the trauma because uh, this person uh, brings to you that's part of the attraction is the things that will remind you and trigger you and hook you into your historical residue and it's your opportunity uh, and that's the reason why you want support systems. That's why you need support systems. That's why for 25 years you've been hanging out in a community um, is because they bring to you um, this uh, caring, holding place so you can work out the rest of the things that we were brought to bring uh, to the surface. So, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what to do with this because I think that people – find intimacy is supposed to be something that is enjoyable and, uh, and and it's not, it's both enjoyable and hard work to become skillful. Yes. My goodness, because so many of the skills are counterintuitive when you consider our mammalian brains, our primitive brains, Mm-hmm. And the whole threat uh, of anything, whether it's uh, your your lover uh, not greeting you versus the you know saber toothed tiger, the body doesn't know the difference, mm-hmm. and we move into fight flight freeze, and um, and all you know all hell breaks loose. And I I, I think it's so important. I I, I am a marital that I am. Uh, psychotherapist and I do a lot of work with couples. I would say about half of my practice is couples, the other half individuals. And uh, they complain about the work. You know, they say, oh, it shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't be so much work. You know, we fell in love and it was wonderful. And of course, we know that's the courtship stage, which becomes the power struggle stage, which becomes the we, we stage real true friends and lovers if we do the work mm. so um and i, I want to remind yeah. people the work is not the relationship the work is my trauma that i bring to the surface it's not often it's like it's placed on the relationship as the issue and it's the, yeah. it's my baggage that i bring to the relationship that i'm trying to heal and um, and the other person joins with me in that healing, and we work together to put both of the bags together to work on the healing. But the truth of the matter is, there's only one skill. Yes, and that is empathy, and the repetitive yeah. process of empathy leading us to compassionate boundaries. That leads us to letting go of the outcome. Now, if we letting can do go those, the outcome. Mm. If we can, if we can do those three skills, 
then we can enjoy the relationship even in the difficult hooks, even in the, the trauma of our history. And if we can okay. continue yeah. the empathy and the compassion and then be able to set boundaries for ourselves, to state what we need, and then let go of the outcome. And each gender, uh, each partner gets attracted to having roles that are uh, bring up the historical residue, generally around power issues. Yes, because I'm not going to let you hurt me. And when my, when my heart is open, yeah. which is necessary for intimacy, then yeah. I am more vulnerable to, to hurt. Mm-hmm. So I, I work with couples who've been married for 40 years who still have steel armor around their hearts mm-hmm. toward each other. And mm-hmm. again, I, I don't think most people recognize the power of what you're saying around that we literally choose people who are in some ways, if you look at Imago theory, mm-hmm. yeah. who remind us of our parents for the yay or primary caretakers of our parents for yay or nay to finish unfinished childhood business. But most people are not aware of that. Um, And this concept, I'll tell you, when I first learned it, like maybe 20 20 years ago or something, uh, just blew me away. I mean, it absolutely reframed everything. You mean my intimates are there to help me heal they're they're in my path they're aggravating and i can't stand them at times and that's all for my benefit to heal yes i mean it's really phenomenal if everybody understood this the world would be very different and that and that and that it's that people aren't doing things to you they're giving you an opportunity to learn how to be skillfully compassion. They're learning and learning how to be skillfully setting boundaries and stating what you need and learning how to let go of the outcome. If you can, if, if, and, and, you know, it goes back to, uh, you know, in my own work with people, it's about sort of allowing them to embrace the serenity prayer in a way, which is accept the things you can't change, which is your partner, you know, right. you, you know, your story, the, their story. The courage is to change and to look at yourself. The most important question in couples and in intimacy is what did I do to contribute to this conflict? Not what did they do, but what did I do that contributed to this conflict? You know, whenever there's an energetic sense of that hurts the relationship, that pulls it away, the, the energy is about asking how did I contribute to that? That is, I so agree, the pivotal question. And unfortunately, we also live in a world where people don't take responsibility for themselves. You and I are members of the recovery movement. I think it's fair to say we are 12 steppers. We have academic education um, and 12 step uh, education and um where we are always taking responsibility for ourselves. We don't use fancy words uh, like, like systems, but it is, it is, um, it is that. What, what did I do to contribute to my partner or any intimate acting out the way he or she is acting out? And, it's be, and going back to the shadow, people are afraid to take responsibility because that makes them a bad person. They, we also live in a society where we're not allowed to be fallible, where we have to be perfect, a competitive marketplace mentality. Just you have to score and you have, you're an object, you're a machine that has to produce mm-hmm. even love. You have to produce even love. Mm-hmm. Well, so, you're, yeah. you're, you're speaking to a beautiful piece of this issue of capitalism and and, and, you know, a, a society that's not based on nurturing relationships, but based on widgets, based on profit, based on outside of the person. And once it gets outside of the person, it's hard to ask the question. It's hard to move. It's hard to move, uh, Duffy, from, from the head 
to the heart. That yes. one, that one foot of uh, of geography from head to heart. <laughs> yeah, it is the most difficult work, and the reason that support groups and twelve steps and and things work for people is that it's a constant gymnasium. It's a constant emotional gymnasium to get down into your heart and to have your heart be the lead aspect and that behind your heart is a backbone. That's where boundaries are. And behind that is letting go of the outcome because you're, you're beyond your body sense. You're beyond your sense of what you've been given. So you lead with your heart, your backbone's behind it, and then you let go. And it's really a consistent, ongoing process, whether it's being a mother to a child or being in an intimate relationship or being in a workforce or being a part of a team. It's a constant process that it's a way of being with people that matters. And it matters that you are in your heart and then you have a backbone. If you don't have both, if you don't have those two, then you'll lead with only kindness. You will tend to get hurt. Yes, yes. But if you only lead with backbone or, the, as you said, armor around the heart. Yeah. That, 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 that means you don't, that you're not adding that level of empathy and compassion. And when you're working with people, it's about how do you get skillful at those three pillars. So I'd like to start with empathy slash compassion for oneself, as we call healthy self-attachment. And most people don't even don't understand that because we've been imbued with the concept that self-love is braggadocious and uh, self-centered, and we're not supposed to love ourselves. Uh, it's crazy. It really is crazy. So well, would you it's say, a, yeah, it, go ahead. It's a, it's a wonderful exercise that I ask people to do once in a while is to just as they stand in the mirror in the morning and getting themselves ready is just to throw out, uh, just to look at the mirror and look at yourself in the eye and say, I love you and see what happens. Um, you know, and just, just notice what happens. Does your eye pop away? Does it, does it feel uncomfortable? Is it unwilling? You know, because you're talking about the, what do you notice about your heart as it relates to you? Now, some people need to literally and honestly do some work of sitting, whether it's meditation practice or something, just sitting with self so that they can drift again from the head to the heart because the heart matters. And so what's your exercise? What is your gymnasium to get to the heart? Now, some people are so into their self that they say, I love you way too much. And, they're, yeah. and, and they need to actually extend it. Uh, yes. They need to give it. Um, and so what I say to people is if you're anxious and you're in the negative self-talk a lot, look for somebody you can be kind to. and It'll get you out of it. So right. self-love is it, it sometimes becomes part of the narcissism of a culture. Uh, yes. And, and I want to be, I always want to be careful because some people are walking around with high levels of self-love and could care yeah. less about others. And it, then yes. others are so caring about others that they don't have self-love. So it's really a duality. It's a duality, and I'm remembering Christopher Lash's book uh, decades ago, Culture of Narcissism. Right. And uh, thank goodness there's so much work and education on narcissism these days. People can readily understand it. And it, it is always a balancing act between self and other. So you're, you're noticing also, you know, that there's the reluctance for people to love themselves, many people with so-called low self-esteem. And then there are people that go to the other end of it. And, and then there are the people who have such a shame base that they flip to the polar opposite of grandiosity. Yes. And unfortunately, we see too, way, 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 way too much of this in the public arena. Very, very grandiose people yep. 
trying to rule the world and believe that they had the ability to do so, um, rather than co-lead and you know be a part of and think things through with your your heart and your mind. And so, where does all this start, Stephen Andrews? How does a person start today? The fundamental need of the human spirit is to be in a small belonging group, in a, in, in, to have a minimum of four compassionate witnesses. They don't need to be therapists, although hopefully your therapist is a compassionate witness. Um, that's part of what I'm doing all over the world is to train therapists to be compassionate witnesses. But it can be a support group. It can be a 12-step program. It can be wherever you can to begin to connect with a small cadre, uh, a gang, if you would, a sense of belonging, a church, a religion, a spirituality, but, but some place in which you can go with your vulnerability. And then in the face of that vulnerability, you'll be met with compassion. I just finished a podcast called The Violence of Advice. Ooh. And, and, and really what is interesting is that when people are vulnerable with people, they put their heart out there about, I'm struggling. They tend to get advice. And what they need is compassion. And what they, wow. get, and what they get is the violence of advice. So they pull back in. And they stop sharing. And that creates depression. That creates rage. That creates injury into the heart and the soul. Our goal, our goal is to be able to bring the vulnerability out into the world. And yeah. the only antidote to that vulnerability, the only antidote is empathy. Yes. And, yeah, and that's the, really the only thing... That, that contradicts the shadow because the shadow is all about secrets. Right. And that's why we call it the shadow. It's behind and we don't acknowledge it to the world. And most people don't acknowledge their own shadow. Yes. Again, I think it's because of the fear of fallibility in a perfectionistic market yes. economy where you are judged by your results and not the process, but the results, not the relations, but the results. And um, my goodness, and we can throw in patriarchy. And, you know, we can um, talk for about three weeks uh, with nonstop on this. Right, Stephen Andrews? That's right. Yeah. So when you, when you say that you train therapists in uh, being a compassionate witness, how can people reach you for your podcasts and for your training? Well, the podcasts are just about everywhere where there's podcasts, Spotify and Apple. And you also you can get to my website, which is Health Education and Training Institute or H-E-T-I main dot org. Um, which is health education and training. Uh, I do have a nonprofit called Dignity Maine, which is really trying to help people deal with this opiate epidemic. Um, and, you know, those are the things that you can find me and try to do some work with it. Uh, I, I just want to go back to one simple thing you said, which is very critical to me. And that is the reason that people are not vulnerable the reason we're divided is because we do not know how to have a conversation in a compassionate way mm. when somebody brings our vulnerability. We are divided all over the place. And we are divided because when people are vulnerable, we're not holding them with great empathy and compassion. Right. Absolutely right. There's no, re there's no reward in it. That's right. And, and Stephen, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I, I do want to uh, just clarify the difference between empathy and compassion. If you use them interchangeably, um, please well, so, explain. So emp empathy, is, emp empathy is the response, and the consistency of empathy is the state of compassion. Oh, 
so if I if I consistently sit with you and do a volley, for instance, a conversational volley, and in that you feel my level of empathy for you, it creates a state of compassion. And I want to define compassion as the ability to sit with suffering. It's the ability of you sitting with your intimate partner, your teammate, your, the people in your life, and their suffering. That is compassion. But the way you do that is through the means of empathy. I see. Well, thank you. I've never heard such a clear uh, distinction. And this is something else in, in our uh, it, it society, object to object, where we have a zillion ways that we don't have to sit with suffering, right? Just surf the internet or put on the latest uh, violent, violent mm-hmm. a TV show, movie, mm-hmm. where you can express your chagrin, your anguish vicariously, have mm-hmm. some sense of release because it's safe, and then you just go on same old, same old pattern. Yeah, and the more isolated we become, the more violent we become. And I couldn't agree with you more that we are primarily defined as social animals. Yeah. And yeah. You know, historically, if we weren't part of the group, we would be picked off by predators. Yep. And, the, and so when people are so embarrassed, oh, my God, if my loved one leaves me, I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. It's because mm-hmm. it, historically, 99% of our time on the planet, we did die. Yes. And we're yeah. hardwired for that. Right. And people are often so ashamed, again, in, in our American society, which is preposterously individualistic to the extreme that if I have any needs, I'm needy and -hmm. something is wrong with me and I'm weak. And and it's amazing that we can even be halfway decent in this world with all of these uh, incorrect, obviously by definition of being a myth and very, very dangerous myths. Mm. It's amazing. So how do you open someone up to the idea that, oh, it's okay to share my vulnerability, but again, as I always say to my clients, with safe people, with trustworthy, with trustworthy people. Yeah, and I'm, well, my words would be that it would have to be a compassionate person. Right, and you'd have to pick and choose that. And I just want to say, Stephen Andrews, that this is we. This is the end of our first show. <laughs> Thank you. I told you we need a week, and that's why I invited you for two shows. So this is a two-part series. <laughs> Look forward to doing it again with you. So, so everyone, please come back next week to hear more of Stephen Andrews' expert on compassion coming from a mean, ugly place, as I can relate to alcoholism and violence was also in my heritage, my family. So, okay, everyone, uh, this is Dr. Duffy Spencer thanking again Stephen Andrews from the Health Education and Training Institute in Maine, wishing you great relationships. <laughs>